the 2020 Australian of the Year for South Australia, um, someone who I know quite well, Dr. James Nithi. Many people don't realise that diabetes is a blinding disease that worldwide is escalating at an alarming rate. Being immersed in darkness, even for just a few brief seconds, can be an intimidating and frightening experience for many of us. In developing Asia, this darkness is their life. I'm passionate about fighting blindness, and we do have a fight right here in Australia. In 2020, I'm taking the fight to diabetes. Welcome to the 60th anniversary of the Australian of the Year Awards. Prime Minister, please do the honours. Thank you. The drum roll, please. The 2020 Australian of the Year is Dr James Mewkey. Dr James Mewkey is the founder of Sight for All, a social impact organisation aiming to improve eye health for everyone around the world. Named Australian of the Year for 2020, such an auspicious year for eyesight. <laughs> this year, I want to challenge our perception of sugar, our relationship with sugar, and the impact that it has on the development of diabetes. Hi there, I'm Dr. James UP. I'm the 2020 Australian of the Year. Let's uh, start the conversation. Hopefully, over the next year, we're really going to see a huge impact on uh, this insidious disease. So welcome and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for our first virtual George Talks with 2020 Australian of the Year, uh, Dr. James Mewkey. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Professor Bruce Neal and I'm the Executive Director of the George Institute here uh, in Australia. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional cust custodians of the country where we're meeting today. I respectfully acknowledge the Bidjigal and Gadigal people from where I stand today and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and make a particular welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've joined us today. In today's talk, we're, we're thrilled to be joined by 2020 Australian of the Year, Dr. James Mewkey. Uh, Dr. Mewkey's career started uh, in Kenya investigating uh, adult blindness. His focus as Australian of the Year is to shine a light on the devastating toll of type 2 diabetes, a spiralling epidemic that's impacting nearly one in 10 Australians. It's an issue that we're passionate about here at the George Institute and I have a strong personal interest in and I'm excited uh, to hear uh, what Dr Mewkey's got to say and to be able to talk about it with him afterwards. We've got more than 300 registrants from around Australia, which I think is a real testament uh, to the way that the research community uh, has managed to pivot to um, online functions uh, during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, today's format will be uh, a presentation uh, with, uh, followed uh, by um, a time for question and answers, uh, which I'll moderate uh, with uh, Dr. Mewkey. Um, we hope to um, leave a fair bit of time for that. So if you uh, do have a question or want to make a comment, um, please type it into the chat box um, down the bottom uh, and the team will moderate those and I'll get through um, as many of them as I can. So on that note, um, I'd now like to hand over uh, to Dr. Mewkey. Thank you very much, Bruce. And, and thank you to the George Institute for inviting me to be here today. It's, uh, it's a really exciting moment for me, actually. It's my first Zoom presentation. In fact, today was going to be my first presentation in Sydney, but of course things, things change and here I am on Zoom instead. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not looking out to a sea of faces, uh, so I can't see anyone's reactions and I'm sorry about that, but uh, I appreciate everyone who's uh, joined in today to be a part of this. So I'll just share my screen now so we can get started.
Okay, now I hope you can all see that. And uh, as Bruce mentioned, uh, I'm an eye surgeon and I've been one for 30 years. And for each of those 30 years, I've been dealing with the consequences that type 2 diabetes, and in fact, diabetes inflicts on the eye. Every yeah, James, year. just to say, we can't actually see your screen at the moment, unfortunately. It did uh, work fine in the, the rehearsals that we did, but can't see it at the moment. Okay, I'll give that a go again. Sorry about that. Um, Yep, that's got it now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Let's start again. So yeah, as, as Bruce mentioned, uh, I'm an eye surgeon and have been one for 30 years. And, and for all of those 30 years, I've been dealing with the consequences that diabetes can inflict on the eyes. Uh, every year, unfortunately, I'm seeing more and more patients with eye disease due to diabetes and in particular, type 2 diabetes, which is a, a preventable dietary disease. Could you imagine waking one morning uh, completely blind? It's impossible to comprehend, isn't it? Uh, unfortunately, I have had a patient who's had exactly that experience. His name is Neil Hansel. Uh, he's an everyday Aussie bloke that constructs light machinery for a living. He has a wife and four kids, and he also has type 2 diabetes. And a few years ago, uh, diabetes changed his world forever. He went to bed one evening with normal sight and woke up the next morning blind in both eyes. One of my colleagues worked really hard to try and retrieve his sight, but unfortunately, it was too late. And Neil was to spend the rest of his life in darkness. This is how Neil views the world these days? Basically, I think I would describe it as seeing everything as a, um, as, as a motion, not as an actual vision. The images, unfortunately, aren't clear. The images, are basically what you see the day through your eyes is what you see the night through your eyes. So there's no clarity. I've seen black figures of people or animals or you know, trees, which is black, onto a, uh, onto a greyish background. So Neil lost his driving license, he lost his independence, and he lost his ability to teach the javelin. It was a hobby and a passion that gave him incredible joy. The thing that upsets him the most, though, is that he can no longer see the smiles on the faces of his grandkids and his wife. This is a picture of Neil's wife and two of his grandkids. This is how he should see them, and this is the reality. Neil is just one of over 100,000 Aussies with sight-threatening eye disease due to diabetes. So how does diabetes actually threaten the sight? Well, it causes damage to the fine blood vessels throughout the body, including the retina, which is the light-sensitive layer of tissue that lines the inside of the back of our eyes. This is a picture of the central vision area of the retina in a patient with diabetes. And here's that same eye a short time later. The diabetes can cause bleeding inside the eye that can take away the eyesight in an instant and sometimes permanently. And the important point here is that nearly all of the loss of vision and blindness due to diabetes is preventable or treatable. And yet to avoid the blinding consequences of this disease, patients with diabetes need to have their eyes checked on a regular basis. But we know that of the 1.7 million Aussies with this disease, more than half are not having these regular, all-important sight-saving eye checks. And that's why diabetes is now the leading cause of blindness amongst working age adults in this country. Probably the leading cause of blindness to the audience who's here with us today. It's also the fastest growing cause of vision loss amongst Aboriginal people. Diabetes was almost non-existent back in the 60s. And these days, there's something like 250 new cases every single day. As an eye specialist, uh, sorry, as an eye specialist, it upsets me greatly to see people who are needlessly going blind from this condition. But what troubles me even more is that as doctors, we're dealing with a disease which has life-changing and life-threatening complications, a disease that is entirely preventable. And it's a dietary disease. As I mentioned, it's due to the consumption of too much sugar 
in our modern diet. So today I'm going to talk to you about type 2 diabetes, how it's arisen, why it's a growing epidemic, and look at some strategies that we can employ to deal with this rising tide of a disease that is a serious threat to our society and to our health system. I mentioned that type 2 diabetes is related to the consumption of too much sugar in our diet. And when I talk about sugar, I'm talking about sugar in all its forms. Uh, what we often think of as sugar is, is what you see here, table sugar, which is sucrose, and sucrose is made of uh, equal parts, glucose and fructose. But there are a number of other sugars that are very prevalent in our society, and, and probably the biggest one, uh, refined carbohydrates. And this is uh, foods such as white rice and the products made from white flour and white potatoes. These refined carbohydrates are simply uh, pretty much pure starch, which is a long chain of glucose, and when it's reaching the gut, it's actually broken down into glucose. So when we're ingesting refined carbohydrate, Fine. Sorry, when we're ingesting refined carbohydrates, we're pretty much ingesting pure sugar. So let's look at how sugar is handled by the body. And I mentioned that uh, table sugar, which is the commonest additive to our food and drinks, is uh, made up of equal parts fructose and glucose. And each of these substances have a different impact on our body. So let's look at them each in turn. So firstly, glucose. When glucose is take it into the body and, and it's absorbed into the bloodstream, it gives rise to the release of the hormone insulin uh, from the pancreas. And insulin helps move that glucose into every cell of our body where it's either stored or used as an energy source. And I like to use the analogy of a subway train in Tokyo where the train car is the, the cell, uh, the passenger with the glucose molecules and the conductor is the, the insulin. With prolonged and excessive intake of sugar, the cell becomes full and the insulin level rises to try and push more glucose into the cell. But eventually the cell becomes so full of glucose that uh, we can no longer get any more glucose into that cell. And so we become what's called insulin resistant and the insulin levels start to rise. And in, in essence, we create an overflow of uh, glucose, which is then taken up by the liver, and the liver stores that uh, excess glucose as glycogen, but ultimately the liver stores also become full. And so the liver then starts to turn the glucose into fat, which is exported away and stored in healthy fat cells, adipocytes around the body. When the production of fat by the liver outstrips its ability to be exported away, the Fat, sorry, the liver then starts to store the fat itself, and we develop ultimately what's called a fatty liver. And this is a picture of a fatty liver, and I'm sure most of you will be aware of the liver, which is normally a deep, dark red color. And here you can see the liver is yellow because it's suffused with fat. And a great example of fatty liver comes from uh, the um, example of uh, foie gras, which is a French culinary delicacy, of course. And foie gras is created by literally force feeding geese refined carbohydrates in the form of uh, high starch cornmeal. And a fatty liver develops within these unsuspecting creatures within about 10 to 14 days. In humans, insulin resistance and fatty liver uh, and prediabetes can actually develop within a couple of months. And insulin resistance and fatty liver are really a key part of this whole process. Let's now look at fructose. Uh, and fructose is that molecule of sugar which gives sweet food and drinks their sweet flavor. It's not recognized as a food stuff by the body. It doesn't trigger the release of insulin and it actually suppresses our appetite control system. And when fructose is absorbed into the bloodstream, it heads straight for the liver and it's immediately converted into fat. So fructose is actually much more dangerous than glucose in giving rise to a fatty liver. And here's a cross section, a pathological specimen of a normal healthy liver. And you can see it's densely packed with cells. And here we have an image of a fatty liver. You can see those distended spaces, which uh, it's essentially just full of fat. 
And ultimately, and through a complex metabolic process, the, the liver becomes full of fat and it can no longer take more fat in. So it then exports that fat away from the liver as triglyceride. And triglyceride is harmful to the body and the high blood triglyceride level in conjunction with the high insulin level in the blood gives rise to fatty plaques, which then block our blood vessels. And this in turn is what results in the many life-changing and life-threatening complications of type 2 diabetes. Blockage of the fine blood vessels can lead to numbness of the hands and feet, and that can sometimes manifest as intractable pain. It can also cause impotence and uh, kidney failure is another serious problem of this blockage of the fine blood vessels. And kidney failure ultimately requires filtering of the blood through dialysis. Uh, and uh, this is not a great way to live your life. Many dialysis patients have to spend up to seven hours a day, four days a week, having their blood filtered. Blockage of the major blood vessels in type 2 diabetes uh, can give rise to gangrene of the lower limbs. And this is a picture of a gangrenous foot in a patient with type 2 diabetes. And unfortunately, gangrene often leads to amputation. And in Australia, every year, there are over 4,000 amputations performed for complications of type 2 diabetes. So again, not a great way to lead your life. And here's our friend, Neil Hansel, and he was in hospital in March this year, just a couple of months ago. This was the day after his ninth amputation in a 14 month period, the complications of his type two diabetes, the ninth amputation just over a year, extraordinary. And poor Neil has also had a heart attack and type 2 diabetes can cause stroke. So this is also a deadly disease. In fact, it's the sixth biggest killer in our society, and it also plays a significant role in some of the other major killers in our society, heart attack, stroke, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. It's also an incredibly expensive disease, and it costing our health system, probably at the moment, in the order of $20 billion every year for the treatment of the disease and lost productivity. So it's a huge and growing problem for our health system. So then how did all this come about then? Well, humans are hardwired to love and seek out sweet things. It's an ancient survival mechanism that helped our early ancestors to survive extended periods of fasting, which were common in early man. It also helped them to avoid toxic and potentially bitter and poisonous foods, which were present in their environment. Prior to the 1600s, sugar was an expensive commodity. It was the domain of healers and holy men, and it was an indulgence that could only be afforded by the wealthy and the powerful. Over the next 300 years, the rising availability and popularity of sugar led to diminishing costs. This was the result of the booming sugar trade. And the diminishing costs meant that sugar became readily available and, and uh, highly accessible. And these days, sugar is quite literally everywhere in our environment and in our lives. Things took a turn for the worse though in 1980 when the Dietary Guidelines for Americans was released. In the decades after World War II, there was noted a rise in heart disease and on no real scientific evidence, it was thought to be due to a fatty diet. And so the Dietary Guidelines recommended that we reduce our fat to 30% and increase our carbs to 60%. And rather than see a downturn in heart disease, heart disease soared, and along with it, uh, type 2 diabetes. In fact, globally, over the last 40 years, there's been a fourfold increase in type 2 diabetes. And this has been even more profound in some communities and countries. For example, in China, there's been more than a tenfold increase in type 2 diabetes in that same time period. And this is somewhat paradoxical because the Chinese diet is high in refined carbohydrates in the form of white rice. But what's happened uh, in China and other parts of Asia is the rising sugar consumption. Sugar was a very minor part of their diet 40 years ago, but there's been in recent times something like a 5% increase per year in sugar consumption. And this has also been an enormous problem in the Aboriginal communities of our country where there's been something like an 80-fold increase in type 2 diabetes over the past four decades. An 80-fold increase is something I find deeply disturbing, and I have no doubt that the diet of 
uh, which is high in sugar and refined carbohydrates, is, is really driving this. And equally concerning is the fact that we're now seeing type 2 diabetes in kids. This was a disease that was formerly known as maturity onset diabetes. However, in Australia now, there are over 1,100 children and teenagers with type 2 diabetes. Worldwide, it's also been a tremendous growth. In 2001, of all the new cases of diabetes in kids, something like less than 3% were due to type 2 diabetes. These days, what's up now close to half of all new cases are due to type 2 diabetes. So this is a really serious, serious problem. And we've even seen there is a famous case in the States of a three-year-old child with type 2 diabetes, a child that had a diet which was very high in sugary drinks. So if we're saying that type 2 diabetes is a dietary disease related to ingestion of too much sugar and refined carbohydrates, highly processed food in our diet, then if it's a dietary disease, then simply there should be a dietary uh, cure for it. And that would be reducing our sugar intake. But there are a number of other factors that I believe are making this much more difficult to achieve. And I call them the five A's of sugar toxicity. And those five A's of sugar toxicity are addiction, alleviation, accessibility, addition, and advertising. And what we'll do now is go through each of those in turn. So firstly, addiction. Sugar is highly addictive. It's been shown to be as addictive as nicotine. So the consumption of sugar activates the reward center in our brains, as does drugs, and it leads to the release of endorphins and feel-good chemicals, such as the neurotransmitter dopamine. It's ultimately what makes us feel good, it's what makes us want to do it again, and it's what gives us those cravings. And like drugs, uh, the more sugar we take in, the more we need to give us that feel-good hit. So it's a vicious cycle that's really hard to break. The second A is alleviation. Uh, we often use sugar to alleviate stress and to make us feel better when we're down. During anxious times, the body is flooded with the stress hormone cortisol, so the body needs to, to balance that with the release of dopamine, and, and sugar is very effective at doing that. Third A is accessibility. As I mentioned, sugar is cheap, and sugar is quite literally everywhere. Uh, these days, you can't walk into most service stations without being confronted by a wall of confectionery, and you certainly can't check out in most supermarkets without being enticed by uh, soft drinks and chocolates, often uh, heavily discounted. In fact, a recent study uh, in Australia has shown that in any one week in the major supermarket chains, that 30% of discretionary junk food is on sale. The fourth A is addition. An astronomical amount of sugar is added to our food and drinks. Something like 75% of all of our food and drinks have added sugar. And this is a particular problem in remote Aboriginal communities where sugary drinks and food are in abundance and fresh and healthy foods are expensive and, and often in scarce supply. The fifth A is advertising. Our world is flooded with TV commercials and ads for sugary products, often in the most insidious of ways, and this has been going on for decades. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I think any strategy that's going to be dealing with this toxic impact of sugar uh, does need to call on resilience. And the resilience, we need to call on personal resilience, but resilience also on the part of business and industry and government. And resilience to me has three key elements. Uh, keeping a cool head, having a positive approach, and innovating. And when I talk about resilience, I like to use the example of Mr. Spock from Star Trek. He's a very cool-headed and resilient character. And I know what he'd do. He'd look to the smoking epidemic to see what's causing its demise. Back when Spock first graced our screens in the 50s, sugar was, sorry, smoking was socially acceptable. In fact, in the years after World War II, uh, something like 80% of men smoked, which I find quite extraordinary. In fact, have a look at this ad from the 50s for candy cigarettes, and you can see the caption, just like Dad. The realization of the health dangers of smoking in the 60s and the subsequent banning of advertising for cigarettes, the taxing of tobacco products, and the rollout of hard hitting and graphic awareness strategies such as these, which we're all aware of, have made smoking socially unacceptable. And as a result, smoking and smoking related diseases and deaths are on the decline in most countries. 
not so sugar and type 2 diabetes and its complications, all of which are on the rise. So we're going to have to engage that resilient, innovative uh, approach to dealing with the five A's of sugar toxicity. So let's look at these once again, each in turn. For addiction and alleviation, it's about awareness, being aware of the addictive nature of sugar and that we're using it to alleviate stress. And for the final three A's, it's about accountability, accountability on the part of businesses, of industry and of government. But firstly, addiction. I suspect much of the world is actually addicted to sugar. I certainly was and probably still am. Uh, the thing that I love the most is ice cream. The bigger the better. And the worst punishment I could receive as a child was to be sent to my bed after dinner without ice cream. And there's really been a day since when I haven't had ice cream. For me, uh, giving up sugar was about giving up the, the really sugary products in my diet. So the fruit juices and soft drinks, the candy and chocolate, the biscuits and cake, and yes, uh, unfortunately, the ice cream. But it's doable. Um, sugar, uh, detoxing from sugar is certainly possible. It does give you unpleasant uh, side effects. In fact, the side effects when I gave up the sugary products really started on day one uh, with headaches. I was really cranky and irritable. Um, clouded thoughts and fatigue. And these symptoms built up over the next few days along with the cravings. The cravings became incredibly intense. But after day three, they started to ease off. And these days I can walk into the tea room, work in fact yesterday, uh, there was a big cake in the tea room and I was able to resist having a, a slice or two which would normally have been drawing me quite strongly. And I don't want to be hardline about this. I still want to be able to go out to a restaurant and enjoy a delicious dessert. I still want to be able to receive a, a mint chocolate frog for my birthday. And I still want to be able to have ice cream after dinner, now, just not every night. For me, this is more a physical dependency, but I suspect for many people, there is a very serious psychological addiction to, to sugar. And so in this sort of scenario, we might need to engage helplines and support groups and, and counselling as we've done for nicotine addiction and for alcohol. The second A is alleviation. So rather than reaching for a sugar hit when we're feeling stressed, why not take the healthier option? And there are lots of healthier options. Uh, you can go for a cycle or a ride or a walk, particularly somewhere beautiful. You can listen to your favorite musical playlist. Uh, you can watch a comedy or you can do a good deed. These have all been shown to be as effective as sugar at countering that cortisol reaction in the body that's happening during stressful times. And the third A, accessibility. This is about accountability of businesses and of government. And there are a number of strategies here. Uh, I was in the School of Medicine and Dentistry uh, not so long ago, and I came across these two vending machines in the study area. This was in one of our major universities here in South Australia. And virtually all of the products were high sugar products. And I've since written to the Dean and they're removing those vending machines uh, from the school. And of course, I think that uh, chocolates and confectionery and soft drinks need to be removed from checkout counters of supermarkets and stores. I mean, you don't need to go into the post office or into the office supply store and be, have to run the gauntlet of sugary products. I've actually written to most of the supermarket chains now in the country and haven't had too many responses yet, but I did certainly get a response from the Foodland Group in South Australia. And I, I was delighted to see uh, literally yesterday, uh, one of their checkout counters, they've replaced the sugary products with, with nuts, which is really exciting to see. The fourth A is addition. And again, this is accountability on the part of, of uh, business and industry and government to account for this astronomical amount of sugar that's added to our food and drinks. I'm sure you have all tried to decipher these nutritional guides on the packets of, of foods. I can barely read them, let alone understand them. And they certainly don't tell us the amount of added sugar. I do prefer a traffic light system, there's a clear and transparent way of telling us how much sugar is in a product, where red, for example, is uh, high sugar, don't buy, uh, amber, think twice, and, and green, good to go. Uh, unfortunately, we have adopted a health star rating system, which is flawed. And it's flawed because it's voluntary. So what 
business, what manufacturer would put a, a low level health rating on a product that it's trying to sell. And it's also flawed because there are a number of foodstuffs that get a healthy rating and they're inherently unhealthy. And orange juice is one of these examples. Orange juice gets a five star rating, and yet a glass of orange juice has almost as much sugar as a glass of cola. And this addition area is where the contentious issue of uh, tax on sugary products comes in. However, there is some good evidence and reasoning behind this. The Spinney Press in 2017 showed that in the 10 years leading up to that year in Australia, sugary drink consumption increased by something like 30%. And sugary, dr sugary drinks have definitely been linked to, to uh, um, the production of type 2 diabetes. And in fact, in something like 200 nations now, sugar has been linked to type 2 diabetes. And a levy on sugary drinks has been shown in a number of countries to reduce consumption. So it does make sense. And the final A is advertising. And again, there are a number of strategies to deal with this. And uh, I think one of the most important is, is quite literally removing TV commercials from free to air TV when our children are exposed, the times when our kids are watching TV. And I think that ads for sugary products should be removed from government buildings and, and public services like uh, trains, trams and, and buses. And all of this needs to be replaced with a comprehensive strategy to raise awareness of the multitude of dangers of sugar and refined carbohydrates in our diet. Um, obesity, type two diabetes, tooth decay. I haven't even talked about tooth decay and dental caries, which is a, a serious problem in our society now. And we do need to see positive messages. We need to know that type two diabetes is a preventable dietary disease. And it's also a reversible disease in many. And a message that I think we also need to, to shout out loud and clear is that the natural fats in our diet, the saturated natural fats in our diet have never been proven to cause heart disease. This is something I've only recently learned. Food products such as what you see there on the screen, but also eggs, milk, cheese, and butter. And in fact, a Mediterranean diet um, has been positively shown to reduce heart disease in the order of 70%. And we also need to see some hard-hitting hard uh, ads on free-to-air TV. And I'm going to show you now a TV commercial that I created for Site Fraud in 2018. I should have kept my medication up and I should have followed the plans that were given to me by my doctors. I woke up one morning completely blind. Uh, thought I was dreaming, went back to sleep for an hour. Uh, woke up and I was still completely blocked off my wife's face when we went to bed. That was the last clear image I had. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? That ad played for about six weeks on Channel 7 nationally back in late 2018, but it was a community service announcement, so it probably played in the wee hours of the morning. I reckon we need to see such ads during primetime TV across all stations and for a prolonged period to really drive this message home to people. Ultimately, it's about education. These days, would you leave a pack of cigarettes on the kitchen counter for your kids to enjoy? Absolutely not. So why would we leave a bowl of candy? We need to exchange that bowl of candy for a bowl of nuts. We need to educate our kids. And yet we can't educate our kids until we know and understand ourselves. How about those soft drinks in our fridge? Perhaps this is their gloomy future. Perhaps like smoking, we need to make sugary drinks socially unacceptable. I'd just like to leave you with one last message from our friend Neil Hansel the day after his ninth amputation. I just had a little joke the other day and I put my hand up and I had a grain of sugar in between my fingers and I said, meet my killer. And people were trying to see what was in my fingers and all it was was one grain of salt, uh, one grain of sugar. Um, and that's what it takes. You know, we've got to, we've got to, we, as a society, we have to do something. We've got to make people aware that the more sugar we can take, the worse this is going to be. And it's just, it's not good, <laughs> it's not good.
As an eye specialist, I never want to see another patient going blind unnecessarily due to diabetes. The doctor, we should not be seeing the life-changing and life-threatening consequences of a dietary disease that's entirely preventable. And as Australians, I think it's time for us to declare war on type 2 diabetes. Thank you. Thanks. James, that's a, that's a, great, um, a great overview um, and incredibly insightful and, and also, I guess, quite threatening as, as well, which um, I think is, uh, is important. Um, I'm going to just dive straight into some of the many questions that have um, come through um, from the audience. And, and, and the first one I, I'd like to pick up on is, um, how do we actually achieve this in practice? So the, the first comment here is that, uh, um, you know, it's easy to educate adults. It's very hard to educate children. How do we, how do we achieve it with children? I mean, I'd actually argue it's pretty hard to educate adults <laughs> um, in, in this space as well. But what, what are your thoughts about where we start um, in terms of that education piece and trying to get people to change their behaviours? Yeah, I think it's um, about educating adults and parents in particular, because I think it starts there. And that's why I was saying, you know, we need to educate our kids, but really we firstly need to educate ourselves. And uh, if I use the example of Neil Hansel, and I was chatting to him, in fact, that day, the day after his amputation, I was uh, just quizzing him about his disease. And was he aware that he was addicted to sugar? No, he wasn't aware he was addicted to sugar. Was he uh, aware of the serious complications um, that diabetes could inflict? And he wasn't aware. So I think, you know, even many patients who have this condition um, are really not truly aware about it. So this is why I think that we need to have a, a really comprehensive uh, awareness strategy, which is multi-pronged. You know, um, after the awards ceremony back on Australia Day, uh, the press all came out the next day saying, Dr. Muki calls on a sugar tax. And the sugar tax is, is one element to it. It really has to be a multi-pronged strategy. And uh, I think, um, that what we need to do is, is um, we need to approach schools. In fact, we're literally in the, at the moment uh, in the process of employing an educator who's going to go out to schools and start to uh, raise awareness at the school level. I think parents need to be educated. And I think by, by adopting these strategies that I mentioned about removing ads from uh, TV and from our society, by reducing the accessibility factor of sugary products from our society, are all really important. I think that um, when people are dependent on a product or addicted to a product, then removing environmental cues is also very important. And that's why I say it's important to remove these sugary food and drinks uh, as much as possible from, uh, from our environment so that those kind of impulse buys don't happen. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's also, I think, just quite simply the labeling on food products so that people are aware how much sugar is added to the products will start to raise awareness of the, uh, of the huge amount of sugar that's added to our food and drinks. I could go on, I'd really love to address many of those things already, but it's, uh, it's, uh, we just need to see um, this awareness strategy reaching uh, all members of the society. And, and unfortunately, the biggest sugar consumption, the biggest consumption of sugary drinks happens in the lower socioeconomic groups. And so we do need to be able to get those messages out to those groups in particular. So um, you, you sort of touched on my, my, my next question there, which was going to be, you know, to what extent is this a, you know, a personal responsibility education issue versus um, a, I, I guess, a sort of corporate responsibility and changing the food environment and food system issue? Because I guess, you know, people will make the argument that, you know, the Australian population hasn't suddenly evolved to become sort of gluttons and sloths over the last 40 years. Um, but we've seen this, you know, massive increase in diabetes and, and the change isn't necessarily in the people, it's in the environment that they live in. So how do, how do we balance um, the interventions that we need to make in terms of putting it on the individuals versus putting it on the companies, government, um, who actually control the environment? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely got to be, be balanced, Bruce, but uh, I talk about this addictive nature of sugar. And when you're addicted to sub a substance, it's often not about choice. And so 
you know, when, with, and you would, um, when someone has an addiction, they, they don't have that choice to be able to, to decide, oh, I'm, I'm going to take the healthier option if there's a healthier option there at the checkout counter. So I think that really the, the, this argument should, shouldn't come into it. But equally, I think if people are not aware that it's addictive and if people are not aware that they're using it to alleviate stress, um, then, then it's hard for them to even begin to make strategies personally to do that. I wasn't aware of how addictive sugar was until literally in the last few months. And as a result of that, that's driven me to sort of take on my personal responsibility to reduce the amount of sugar. I mean, a lot of the gleanings that I've talked about today is something that I've, even me as a doctor, wasn't aware of. And I'm, I'm only just starting to understand and, and wanting to communicate these to people because I have never seen anything on free to air TV to, to raise awareness of, of all of these issues that for so long, for 40 years, as you say, uh, we've adopted. And what happened, as I mentioned back in 1980, when the American dietary guidelines were released, uh, became this avalanche of the low fat uh, campaign, the low fat diet, which really then became this huge driving force uh, for the development of type two diabetes. So when the amount of fat drops, in food, you actually have to replace it with sugar to, to, uh, to improve the flavor and to make it satisfying and satiating. And so this is really what the, the big driver has been. So it's, um, uh, I think this is where, uh, you know, this huge amount of added sugar and the accessible nature of, of and the advertising all needs to be uh, taken into account. And, and we have to see accountability on the part of, uh, as I say, businesses, industry and government. So we, we've got a flood of questions coming in, actually. So I'm going to try and get through a few um, quickly here. So um, you mentioned sugar tax, and we've had a number of comments about sort of um, industry influence, um, government inaction. Um, what do you think is really holding things back in Australia? I mean, we've seen sugar taxes implemented in a large number of jurisdictions around the world, and often um, by right-wing governments, not necessarily by the sort of nanny state left-wing governments. Um, what do you think would be need, needed to make a change here um, in Australia to make a sugar tax um, plausible? Yes, I think if you look at some of those studies have shown that a 10% increase or a 10% tax on those products actually result in a 10% drop in consumption, which is actually huge. And I think what many countries have adopted is a 20% sugar tax. I think what's driving the lack of uh, will for this to happen in Australia, uh, a number of factors, one of which are, um, is the huge amount of revenue that comes uh, from, from sugary products. Also the um, jobs, you know, the, the jobs, the sugar industry and the sugar growers industry. And also that I think some of these areas are in marginal seats. So this is, I think very much, uh, in, in people's minds and in the government's minds. I also think that many of us are still hoodwinked by this, this, as I mentioned, this 40 year obsession with a low fat diet, which was based on no scientific evidence. In fact, dietary cholesterol does not increase blood cholesterol. It does not increase heart disease. Even myself, you know, with this knowledge, I'll, I'll, these days I'll, I'll go to put butter on my, on my, uh, on my multigram bread, uh, but I still have this kind of, guilt there that this is not good for me because it's just been driven into our minds for so long. So I think it's, it's a really important for people to be aware of this so that they can start to make the healthier choices in their food. Now what's happened with the, um, in Australia is that the government has come up with a deal with the, the, uh, the non-alcoholic beverage industry to reduce sugar uh, in sugary drinks by 20% by the year 2025. Now I understand that they're not on track to achieve that. But the way that they're dealing with that is not to reduce the amount of sugar in sugary drinks across the board. What the non alcoholic beverage industry is doing is actually simply broadening the portfolio to include more drinks and to have more drinks with 20% less sugar, let's say, so that on average, sugar drops. But there's still the the, sugary, the, hip, the fully sugared products um, and the very popular products are not changing. So my gut feeling is that we're not going to see any difference whatsoever. And when we know that there are still 2 million people with pre-diabetes, it looks like we're probably going to double type 2 diabetes in the next 5 to 10 years in Australia. We need to do something more urgently, and, and I don't think this is going to cut it. And, and unfortunately, we're just going to see 
even now, I think with the COVID epidemic, we're going to see uh, a surge in type 2 diabetes beyond the 280 cases a day because of the unhealthy dietary choices that people are making unwittingly. Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, we, we at the Institute would be, would be strongly in alignment with that view that, you know, really um, the, it's the food environment um, and the influences over um, what's on the shelves, what they cost, what's at the checkout, which is, you know, really driving um, the changes that we're seeing and, and probably where the greatest opportunity uh, for improvement is um, trying to persuade 25 or trying to educate 25 million Australians to do the right thing versus trying to persuade three or four retailers to change the way that they present food or a few thousand manufacturers to change the way that they manufacture food is ostensibly, I mean, it's still a challenging proposal, don't get me wrong, um, but it does at least seem tractable um, in a way that, uh, you know, perhaps some of the others can seem, can seem pretty intimidating. And I think there has been a, a long-standing focus on this is a personal responsibility problem and we, and we need to switch that to actually start thinking about the environment in exactly the sorts of ways that uh, you're describing. Um, I just make, I just make a point. I mean, I think that's what the way the sugar industry has been landing the blame on, on, on personal responsibility. I think we do need to shift that away. Uh, the other thing with, um, uh, with this is that, you know, if we look at uh, cigarettes and cigarette smoking, uh, that arose over a period of decades and it's taken decades for it to drop. So I'm under no uh, illusions that this is going to take some time. I'm not expecting within a year to see major changes. But, you know, as I mentioned, it was wonderful to go into Foodland this week and to see that they have nuts there. And, and I'm hoping to engage all of these supermarket chains. As I say, I've had very little response, but I'm, I'm giving them a bit more time because... Uh, they've been obviously consumed with ensuring that their uh, supermarkets are supplying all the goodies that, that we need during the pandemic. Um, but uh, I, I, what I would love to see by the end of the year on free to air TV is a comprehensive strategy which which does warn uh, um, the public about the dangers of, of sugar and sh sugary products, and, and also to to also talk about some of those really serious complications that we see as a result of type two diabetes. Yeah, look, and I think you're in a you're in a unique position. You're not going to change everything in a year, but you're in a very powerful position for a year. So um, we will in encourage you and support you in everything that uh, that you might want to do. Look, um, there, there are so many questions here, but I'm just going to to flip now. We've had a number of questions about eye screening, and um, uh, obviously blindness is a is, is a big focus uh, for you. Um, some pretty interesting advances being made in eye screening over the last um, last few years, as as I understand it, in terms of automation and things. To what extent is is this um, going to be a sort of a solution to the problem or is this really sort of trying to, trying to shut the barn door after the horse has bolted? We're talking about telehealth, telemedicine, and uh, there are a lot of strategies now being developed to screen the backs of people's eyes. So we call the back of the person's eye the fundus. So this is what we call fundus screening. And there are a number of um, ways we can do this. And they're certainly developing uh, artificial intelligence platforms to be able to do it. So at the moment, if a patient with diabetes, so any form of diabetes, so type one and type two diabetes are, are both blinding diseases. So patients with any form of diabetes need to have their eyes checked. And if they don't have any disease, this is a, a longish conversation, but if they don't have any disease, you know, they will probably get away with every couple of years. But certainly, you know, we would say that a patient with uh, diabetes probably should have their eyes checked uh, at least on a yearly basis. Uh, if they have disease, they may require more frequent examinations. And those examinations usually involve going to visit the optometrist or the ophthalmologist. Um, not so much the GPs. I think the GPs, with uh, they can screen backs of eyes, but I think they generally these days uh, depend on uh, the eye specialist to be able to do it. And if we see then that only half of all people in Australia, so half of 1.7 million people, and not having their eyes checked, there's something really wrong here. One of which is that maybe they're not aware of the dangers or maybe it's not palpable to them. And so to hear stories like Neil Hansel's who literally went blind overnight, you know, needs to be out there. And we do need to, um, I think often if we look at, um, you know, people in their working age, they're busy and, and they're too busy to go to the optometrist or the ophthalmologist. And there might be other groups of people who feel that uh, it's too expensive. And so they just avoid doing it. And I know Neil Hansel, he's, 
he neglected his uh, screening visits, not just to the ophthalmologist, but also to other areas. And so he really paid a price as a result of that. And so hopefully having uh, artificial intelligence, um, telehealth screening facilities in health centres around uh, metropolitan areas and rural uh, communities and Aboriginal communities will uh, ultimately be something that will improve the strike rate of being able to detect disease uh, efficiently, effectively, and then refer those patients with disease in to see the specialist. We, a few years ago, tried to set up uh, a telehealth as, um, program in, in a, a remote Aboriginal community, but unfortunately it wasn't very successful. We weren't getting great quality, but I think the technology these days with AI hopefully will take it to a new level. And I think you'll see this will unfold in the coming uh, months to years. Okay, so we're, we're, we're getting towards the end of time, unfortunately. There are lots of questions that I haven't been able to, to ask. Um, but what, what I'd like to do, just, just to finish, um, on a slightly more personal note, James, is, I mean, this has been a sort of um, Annus Horribilis, I'm showing my English background there, but uh, for, for Australia. Um, bushfires at the, the beginning of the year, which you mentioned um, in your acceptance speech, and most recently the COVID-19 um, emergency, we've managed to get through a whole hour without mentioning COVID-19 almost. Um, but uh, as we hope for some elevation um, in the, uh, the lockdown rules or some release from the lockdown rules, what, what have you found hardest um, over the, the last month or two and what are you most looking forward to um, if we do get some good news out of the government today? Yeah, sure. It's, it's been an extraordinary time for me. You know, as uh, Scott Morrison said, this is the, the worst year of our lives. So here I am, Australia of the Year, in the worst year of our lives. In that first week or two after the um, Australia Day weekend, it was overwhelming and frenetic. I was just getting bombarded with requests to speak and to, uh, for interviews and for advocacy, and it was incredibly exciting. And then in the subsequent month, in March, I was one by one uh, crossing all of those things off, including the uh, opportunity to speak at the George Institute. Fortunately, and, and which is really great, a number of the, the conference platforms have done the old pivot and um, gone online. Some of them have been postponed to next year and others have just outright cancelled. But for me, myself, I, what I've done, you know, I was actually quite despondent through much of March thinking, goodness me, you know, the opportunity to raise awareness of, of the blinding impact of diabetes, the, the role of sugar in causing type 2 diabetes, and to raise awareness of site for all in our work, which is impacting on about a million people around the, uh, in some of the poorer parts of the world every year, um, really was quite disheartening for me. But I, I turned around, I, I tried to keep positive, and then I started to develop some online tools. So I've uh, recently filmed this presentation actually, well, the version of this presentation, which we're also going to be able to release online in the very near future. I filmed that with my son, who's a filmmaker. I filmed some key messages, which will be released through the Australia Day Council's website and through my own social media as well. So I'd love people to, to follow um, the site for a website, the Australia Day Council website, and my own personal website, Dr. James Mukey, um, on Instagram and Facebook. And so they can sort of see these messages and share these messages. I think this is a really important part of, of this. So, yeah, certainly looking up for me, um, there's a lot of exciting things happening and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this year will ultimately be uh, able to reach more people. I think the online platform does allow me to, to reach more people. And the thing that I'm looking forward to, um, hopefully very soon in South Australia, we've had a really good run, is just going out to dinner at a restaurant with some friends. You know, that's something that, that, that we've really missed. So, and some uh, ice cream. And some ice cream, yeah. <laughs> All right. So... James, um, thanks ag again for um, making uh, the effort to, to, to do this um, online. Um, it's been tremendously successful. We have had you know, well over 200 um, registrants. We don't normally get that for our George Institute uh, um, seminars. So um, you, you, you've pulled a crowd for sure. Um, if anyone wants to know more about site for all siteforall.org um, is, the, is the web address. Um, you can go there um, and you can get more information. So thanks to all of you um, for joining us today. Our next virtual webinar will be a conversation with the Honourable Dr. Andrew Lee um, MP on Thursday, the 4th of June, and he'll be sharing uh, his work on public policy and economics that challenge uh, our conventional ways of thinking. Um, we think this will also be relevant, um, particularly relevant in the COVID-19 era and our need to think about different ways uh, of doing things. So please, Keep an eye on the, the George Institute's website and social media uh, for registration details.
So on that note, thanks again, James, and everyone for joining. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Bruce, and thanks everyone for being a part of it. And thank you to the George Institute. Really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to talk to everyone today. Thank you.